Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and today we are visiting with Pastor Matt Fry, coming to us live from Clayton, North Carolina. Matt, welcome to the program. Hey, it's an honor to be on your program today. Well, it's great to have you with us. Matt's got a new book out uh, from uh, Charisma House uh, entitled, I Am, and it's a uh, great book that takes you into just a uh, personal deep dive into understanding what we would call the seven I am's. Uh, there's really eight total, but we're going to attribute the seven I am's to Jesus. Uh, Matt is the lead pastor at C3 Church in Clayton, North Carolina, about 20 miles southeast of Raleigh. God called Matt and his wife Martha to start a church that would connect with where people are living today. Their passion is to provide real hope for real people in a real world. Uh, Matt is also on the Association of Related Churches lead team and has created a Get Real Network with 100 other pastors. We're personally very familiar with ARC and my good friend Pastor Chris Hodges right down the street from our studios. Uh, <clears throat> as we launched a new work here, uh, there was a point in time when Birmingham, Alabama was the home of uh, two very noteworthy accomplishments, the fastest growing church in the United States, Church of the Highlands, and the mm -hmm. fastest Messianic congregation, Messianic Jewish congregation in the world, Congregation wow. Bethel El, that I founded. So Chris and I both work side by side in bringing a vision to this community that uh, has been long lasting and enduring. Uh, so yeah. we're delighted to have you on the program and I understand your daughter is a graduate of Highlands College and yes, sir. is uh, finishing out her graduation on a mission trip in Peru. Exactly. So this week she's in Lima, Peru uh, with the Highlands College uh, finishing up. She just graduated last Saturday, so she's, she's graduated with her degree, but uh, taking this one last trip. So one last very trip. proud of her. And what are the plans for her when she returns? Well, she's coming back to North Carolina, and she's going to serve as my full-time personal assistant. Wow, that'll be interesting dynamic, uh, both on a personal and professional level. It'll stretch your relationship to uh, interesting. Uh, as you know, Pastor Chris's sister is his executive assistant. And right. uh, that has been uh, a tremendous blessing for Church of the Highlands and for ARC and for the growth of uh, uh, just a, a great uh, network of churches, great network of leaders, and yeah. and a uh, personally uh, at the help of uh, of uh, a wonderful Pastor Gateway Church, giving a new sense and a new vision for Israel to the ARC churches to really truly grab a hold of a depth of understanding of Israel, not just in. Uh, end time prophecy, but in the entirety of the scripture, uh, the significance and the importance, of course, of the Jewish Messiah, the subject of your book, who, when he says and reveals the words that are the two most extraordinary words in scripture, I am, uh, makes the connection to that day that Moses stands before God and says, and who shall I say sent me to Pharaoh? And yeah. that was uh, uh, quite a stunning, stunning uh, revelation. Mm -hmm. uh, when you uh, planted, and you say, how many years ago? 18 years ago? Right, 18 years. It'll be 19 years uh, this fall. Uh, when you had that vision, were you... Um, Fast forward to today, then go in retrospect to kind of see, did you see this coming? Is this what the Lord had shown you in planting the congregation there? Are you reaching who you thought you'd reach? And have there been any really staggering, stunning surprises along the way? Well, there's been lots of surprises. You know, we started C3... Uh, over 18 years ago, I'd only been a youth minister, so that's all I knew. So when we started the church, I just uh, I did what I did in youth ministry, and we had passionate worship and 
uh, we had relevant teaching and we tried to uh, build a bridge to where people live today and you know we moved down here we had about 50 people in an elementary school cafeteria uh, and I just thought man if we could, I knew God was gonna do something big I just didn't know exactly what and I thought man if we could just reach a few hundred people if we could just help a few hundred people and help them find hope and help them find Jesus then that would be amazing well as a two-year-old church we were already over 300 people attending every week and uh, as a three and a half year old church we bought 33 acres and built our first building uh, the school had asked us to move out and there was nowhere else to go so we took that as a sign from God that it was time to step out on faith and look for land and buy land and build a building which uh, which God uh, helped us to do and looking back now it seems pretty crazy that, that that happened, but at the time, we just didn't have another option. We just thought, well, let's take, take a step of faith. And so there's been lots of things that have happened that, uh, that are for the good and for the challenging that um, you know, have surprised me. But uh, overall, just, just at the end of the day, to see people find hope in Jesus and people that are far from God, our, our church reaches people that, that often would not go to uh, a, a different type of church. They, they're looking for a church that is going to be real and authentic. And um, our church is definitely not perfect, but we have a uh, we like to call ourselves a life giving church, mm -hmm. and we plant life giving churches through the ark. And so when people come to our church, we want them to know that God loves them, we love them too, and we want to build them up, uh, not tear them down. We want to encourage them, not discourage them, and share the life giving message of Jesus in a way that they can relate to. So it's been an amazing journey and to, to baptize all three of my kids in our church and to, to see the lives have been changed and, and now um, just generations being impacted because one of the benefits of being here for almost 19 years now, I'm starting to see uh, generations impacted where the parents got saved and now their children have, are getting saved and, and even on to grandchildren. So uh, it's been an exciting journey. But in the book, of course, I share some of the challenges that I went through. Of course, and, and uh, those are some of the things that uh, we are going to explore. Uh, tell me about your uh, kind of upbringing. Were you raised in the church? Was your wife raised in the church? How did you two ultimately meet? And, and how did this become a shared vision for the two of you? Yeah, both of us grew up in Christian homes. Both of us grew up uh, as PKs. Her dad was an ordained pastor, and uh, my dad was as well. Um, and uh, my dad was a denominational leader in, in a Baptist denomination. And so our parents had known each other for a long time. Uh, we, our moms actually introduced, our, introduced us to each other after a church service uh, here in North Carolina, a church that my dad was pastoring at the time. And her grandma was a charter member of that church. And so our moms introduced us to each other. And about seven years later, we're both living in Atlanta, Georgia. And we start uh, uh, dating and uh, spending time together. And we got married. In fact, this year, in fact, this Wednesday, we're celebrating 25 years of marriage. Well, congratulations. It's quite a, quite a milestone. Uh, Thank you. So uh, I, I know Atlanta well. I was there from 1975 till 2007 when I came over here. So 32 years over there. Yeah. Uh, were you, did you get involved in a church? Were you in school? What was? Yeah, I, w I went to Liberty University actually on a wrestling scholarship huh. with no plans of, of going into the ministry. Uh, but while I was there, that's where God got a hold of my heart. And I share a little bit of that story in the book of where I wrestled with God and, and kind of went from uh, what I call in inherited faith to personal faith and really r realizing that Jesus is my personal Savior. Mm -hmm and understand the truth of his death and his resurrection. And uh, so after that, I started getting involved in ministry. I was a youth minister, as I mentioned. Uh, when I went to Atlanta, Georgia, I was a youth pastor at a church there uh, in the eastern part of uh, Atlanta in Gwinnett County. And my wife moved to Atlanta while I was serving as a youth pastor, and she worked for a gospel singer named Babby Mason. Sure. And so we began, and since we had known each other from the past, we got together and started uh, just spending time together and just as friends. And of course, that developed into uh, a dating relationship and eventual marriage. And now we have uh, three awesome children. So she had a passion for ministry, obviously. She worked on staff at a church as an assistant uh, worship leader, 
prior to working with Babby Mason, um, and she has been right by my side in uh, the whole journey from youth ministry to planting C3. Uh, she is an incredible blessing to, um, to not only me, but all, the whole church family. Uh, she leads worship, oversees our creative arts. Uh, she's an incredible teacher and preacher, um, a great leader, and, and an awesome mom. So I'm very blessed that we get to take this journey together. Well, it sounds uh, incredibly exciting. When uh, you got the vision to write, uh, I know you blogged before, and that's part of the way you've communicated with, uh, and coming out of youth ministry, uh, you almost have an inherent advantage uh, that people don't realize because the blogging, Facebooking, social media, that's the world that really ignited uh, that whole mode of right. communication. Mm -hmm. So in the past, it was the church bulletin, uh, the church messenger was uh, a handout on Sunday morning. Right. All, all that has been gone to one side and now uh, there's blogs and there's interactive and there's calendars and there's uh, the Twitter presence and the Facebook presence and you know we, we reach literally uh, one post uh, will touch a half a million people Wow in seconds uh, the moment we posted to our Twitter feed of about a hundred and I don't know, 175,000 or so, uh, there's a 10 to 1 exponential ratio. Mm. Uh, so 175,000 turns into 1.75 million impressions that are going to be out there just on a single post. Wow. And you begin to realize the impact of a program like this, an impact right. of your blogs, of your ability to watch online, and we're mm -hmm. seeing that there are communities and nations being touched yeah. and being reached because they can now watch a program like ours out of the privacy of their home, right on yeah. their phone, where the imam is not looking over their shoulder, where yeah. uh, in the Hindu nations that we reach in India and remote parts of Pakistan and Afghanistan, and we're actually prime time in the wow. Middle East. We're prime time in Asia. So <clears throat> right now, just add eight hours and then keep on ticking. And we are the prime time Christian broadcast into those individual homes. And you begin to realize that there is an incredible reach, an incredible touch point that you're having right now in talking about what you've experienced in a town in North Carolina mm -hmm. that <clears throat> maybe the only reference point they would have is Andy of Mayberry. <laughs> They're now meeting Matt Fry <clears throat> of Clayton and realizing that there is a uh, strong move of faith of hearing a story of 50 people meeting in a class environment at a school and today you're running how many thousands? We have over 2,000 on the weekend and probably 5,000 that call C3 their church home. And that kind of exponential growth lets people know that number one, the gospel is alive mm -hmm. and well and God is still on the throne. Mm -hmm. And that's an exciting message. Yeah, it's been amazing. It's a God thing. The move from youth ministry to, let's just call it senior pastor role right. over a large congregation. Uh, there's an old adage that says that most people never really change that much from what they were like in high school. Mm. So you may have people that are 30, 40, 50 years old you have yeah. some in the 18 years that you knew as youth. Uh, do you minister to them differently than you did back then? Or do they still have the same touch points and do they still have the same need for the same kind of 
of uh, application of the word as they did when they were seniors in high school. Yeah. Well, people are attracted to authenticity. They're attracted to where there's life. Mm -hmm. And whether you're a teenager, whether you're an adult, people are attracted to where there's people are real and honest and not trying to be fake and phony. And I tasted and experienced uh, religion that was fake and phony, kind of more about what's on the outside than what's on the inside. And at our church, we just try to like reach people where they are today. Uh, I share from my failures and how I overcame them. Uh, Martha and I share about our challenges and, and how God helped us to get victory over them. And whether you're a teenager or an adult, we found that people are attracted to that. Uh, you know, Christianity is about a relationship not just religion, and that Jesus came to have to give us life and to give it to us abundantly. Um, so as we grow older, sometimes the pain and hurt from our childhood and teenage years come to surface, and so helping adults overcome the pain and hurt from their past uh, is maybe one of the unique things, but even teenagers and young adults have already experienced much pain in this world, and and uh, they need help to be to overcome even uh, the, the past that they, they have. So uh, it's, there's, a, there's some differences, obviously, because of maturity level, but there is a hunger. And I think even today, I'm discovering, even with, uh, in, with this book, The I Am, I'm discovering there's a hunger today in our culture for truth, for what's real, and how can I find real answers to life? And uh, you know, there's a real hunger for that. So no matter what age you are, people want to know the truth. They want to know who can I trust and, and where, where do I find uh, the answers to these questions I'm dealing with. <clears throat> Everybody's familiar with the statement that Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted and set the captives free. Mm -hmm. I always find it interesting that he doesn't define captive to what. Hmm. He doesn't give us. It doesn't say I, I came to set the captives free from sin or I set the captives free from death. Okay. It's, it's a dot, dot, dot mm. to set us free from whatever it is that yeah. is keeping us from being in relationship with God. So yeah. it's really set us free from darkness is the mm -hmm. ultimate overarching truth of captivity mm. to darkness because the light has overcome the darkness. Mm -hmm. And so people are drawn to light. It's a yeah. natural part of the pupil of the eye is to be drawn that even in total abject darkness, our eyes are always searching for the light. And once we find it, that becomes our focal point. Right. And we no longer study. We no longer focus on the darkness. We hold on even to just even that pinprick of light, we continue to keep our focus there. So it's mm. quite extraordinary. You talk in the book about uh, your journey. Uh, what parts of that journey really led you to the point of writing a book? Well, the journey started many years ago when I was in youth ministry and kind of in between churches and and what I realized was I had found my identity in what I did. My whole life, uh, my whole life, I just kind of saw myself as Matt Fry the blank. And whether it was Matt Fry uh, in high school and college, Matt Fry the wrestler, and then uh, then when I went into ministry, I was Matt Fry uh, the youth pastor. And I was always uh, my identity was always in like what I did. Mm -hmm. And whenever that was taken away from me. And I share actually in the very beginning of the book, I share about just feeling uh, just um, somewhat abandoned by God, like I had given him my life and to serve him in ministry. And, and now here I am and I'm no I'm not in a church and and how humbling that was. But that's when, uh, you know, that's when God begins to teach you when you're at your lowest point. And he God took me to uh, Philippians chapter three, where Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I'm like, yes, Lord, I want your power. And then it says, but fellowship and sharing with my suffering. And I was like, I don't want that part. Can I have just the power without the suffering? 
And God said, this is why you're going through what you're going through right now. You're going through this suffering to understand who you are in Christ. That you're not defined by what you do. You're not defined by your title. You're not defined by your past. You're not defined by what other people have said about you. You are a child of God. And out of that, you just so happen to be a youth pastor, or you just so happen to be a senior pastor or a lead pastor. And that revelation began many years ago. And then through the journey, several years ago, um, actually after coming back from one of my trips to, to Israel, uh, really understanding that in the, in the Old Testament, God says, he, he tells Moses, I am, that's my name. I am that I am. And, you know, that's such a powerful concept to see that God is whatever you need. He's the beginning and the end. He's He is the great I am. And then when Jesus shows up, he shares I am. And he gives us I am statements or I am declarations. And then the Bible is filled. And this was the revelation that I had. In the Old Testament, you have Jesus, uh, God telling us his name is I am. Jesus shows up, the three in one. He is He is the great I am because he also is God, but he declares, I am light, uh, I am the light of the world, and I am the way, the truth, and life. And m multiple times he shares these I am statements. But then God says, because of that, then I am. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am more than a conqueror. And there's, we, de we define 31 I am declarations. So the, here's the big idea and the revelation that God gave me a few years ago, before I even realized it was going to be a book, it was just my own journey with God, mm -hmm. but was this, that when I encounter the great I am, that's when I discover who I am. That there's a direct connection between the great I am and who Jesus says I am to who I am. And then living out my identity, not based on past hurt, pain, success, failures, what I do, my title, my degree, my education, my career, but based on who God says that I am, and then the power of declaring that over my life every day, and and uh, rather than declaring what the world has said about me, what uh, what you know words that may have been spoken over me, but declare the promises of God every day. So that's why we encourage people, take these 31 declarations and take one every day, and morning, and throughout the day and at night, declare that over your life because that's where the power is, that's where the peace is. Matt, you know, as you're, as you're talking and uh, I'm listening very carefully to what you're saying, I want to make a statement to you and I want you to take a very, very deep, long breath when I make it to put it in absolute context. Jesus said those seven I am's before the New Testament was written. Mm. It's powerful. To the people who God had already declared I am. Mm. We forget that the life and times of Jesus occurred during the Old Testament times. Yeah. That the writing of the New Testament is the writings of first century Judaism. Yeah. And when Jesus stands before 5,000 and says, I am, they all know from where he speaks, mm. from what he says, when he says the words, I am. Yeah. And when we look at that, no New Testament at the time that he makes these declarations puts him in the context of the eight times that God says, I am. Mm. We assign the seven times that Jesus says, I am, to the New Testament. Mm. But in fact, there are great eight I am's, and they are all in the Old Testament because wow. there was no New Testament until Jesus died on the cross. Yeah, and so that's powerful. And so when you frame that and you realize that this is the same message, the same God, mm. only now through a messenger that God sends in the flesh, 
And Jesus makes it very clear. I only say what I heard my father say. Mm -hmm. And now you know yeah. the eight I am's and why these are such incredible declarations. He says, yeah. I and the Father are one. And when we say yes to Jesus, we become one with Messiah. Yeah. One with God. We're talking with Matt Fry, author of a wonderful new book, I Am, uh, just a uh, uh, incredible study into us being created in God's image and therefore because we are created in the image of God because he is we too are what he is we too can become a part of through relationship and that he defines us we do not define him and that was the clarion moment for Matt Fry to be yeah. able to look at that and say, I don't define God, God <clears throat> defines me. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back on the other side of the break, we're going to dig into this fabulous work and understand who the bread of life is, who the light of the world is, who the door is, who the good shepherd is, and what God is talking about when through Jesus himself, he says those words, I am. We'll be right back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatica Nation and host of the daily TV program, Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the books and media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live four hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The Teaching Archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, Prophecy in the News videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. 
Every day, you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heart lines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we are visiting with Matt Fry, author of I Am, Encounter the One Who Gives You Purpose and Peace in a Crazy World. Matt, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much. It's an honor. Well, it's just, uh, it's fun. This is going to be fun, uh, fun to talk about what's led you to this point. Uh, and not only do you have a book, which was just released uh, three weeks ago, you also have, along with it, a participant's guide, uh, right. helping you to navigate this to make it even more personal, even more engaging, uh, not just information, but application, which makes it that much more real. And I want to make sure that they know they can go to the books and media page at ignitinganation.com and click on I Am, and that'll take you right there where you can get both the paperback book, I Am, as well as the participant's guide uh, to encounter the one who gives you purpose and peace in a crazy world. So, Matt, here's Moses right, standing before the glory of God. He is talking to the one who has promised Abraham, the patriarch, that he would be a stranger in a strange land and be enslaved for 400 years. Mm -hmm. Moses is now there at that actual 430 year mark from the time right. of Joseph's entry into Egypt. And God puts him on a mission. Moses listens carefully to the assignment and at the end, he says, okay, you want me to deliver this message. Oh, by the way, who should I say sent me? Mm. So here you are, you're Moses, you're standing there, you're asking that question. Right. And you get an answer. What's the answer? Well, he says, God says, I am. I am that I am, that's my name. That's my memorial name. That's what I'll be known uh, forever. I am that I am. Always have been, always will be. The very establishment that something exists would be the declaration of I am. Mm. So Moses becomes an ambassador delivering a message to Pharaoh who believes in many gods right. that the one God who declares himself as the I am is the one who sent him. Right. The deliverance, yeah, the deliverance comes for the children of Israel. 
they spend 40 years with God right there in the midst of them. Mm -hmm. And a nation that began as Joseph as one and 70 that he sent for has now become 600,000 men, 2 million in all, mm. traveling with God right there in the midst of them. The God who says I am is right there. Yeah. Yet this journey takes them on a path that separates them from God. Hmm. The law is given. The law is rigid. You break one letter of the law, you break all the law. 2,000 years goes by. And God sends one to bring a message. Mm-hmm. And the message is framed the same way to the same people, to the same audience, mm -hmm. to the same group that are living under the same exact laws given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. And Jesus delivers the same message and it's the topic and it's the subject and the focus of your book. Mm -hmm. And the message is, I am. Yeah. Walk us through this. Take us to the questions that you ask because you ask, and the first question you ask is, are you satisfied? Yeah. So Jesus shows up and uh, we see that he declares, I am. And I think it's interesting to see that he begins every statement with, I am. And as I read through the, the, the statements that Jesus made, the declarations, I also noticed that it, it relates to real life questions that people have today. You know, we live in a, in a world of uncertainty. We live in a, a world some people call it's kind of a crazy world, unexpected, with things happening globally. There's a lot of uncertainty, whether it's the economy or terrorism, and, and we put our faith in all different types of things. And there's all these questions, but Jesus already had the answers before we even had a question. And he says, he declares seven times, first of all, he says, I am the bread of life. So if you are looking for satisfaction, and many people are like, I, I just don't feel like I'm satisfied. I don't feel like I'm fulfilled. Well, Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. When you have an encounter with me, you will be satisfied not only temporarily, but eternally. And if we look to the things of this world to try to satisfy us, whether it's money, career, success, fame, fortune, even other relationships, we're going to be left with a void. But only when we have an encounter with the great I am who declares, I am the bread of life, then that void will be filled, fulfilled. And then there's nothing wrong with success. There's nothing wrong with having a career. But those things don't define you anymore. You understand that, that I am already content and I'm living my life out of a fulfillment already that I, have, I serve the God who is not just the God of enough, but he's the God of more than enough. He declares, I am the bread of life. Do you remember when <clears throat> Jesus says that I am the bread of life? Mm -hmm. For 2,000 years, the people that he was speaking to had been eating the bread of affliction. Right. The bread made in haste as we fled from Pharaoh. So right. here for 2,000 years, a people are eating the bread of affliction. And now Jesus is offering them, instead of the bread of affliction, the bread of life. Yeah. Deliverance Absolutely. from that which has afflicted you, a memorial to your enslavement. I now will bring you fulfillment. And he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of this bread will never go hungry. Yeah. You know, Jesus had fed the 5,000, and so they saw this miracle of like, wow, that's amazing. Uh, and why don't, you, why don't you do that again? And that's when Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. It's, if, you, if you have an encounter with me, you'll never go hungry again. 
So then you take us and you ask the question, do you feel lost? Right. And many people do. They feel lost. I mean, I was just thinking about questions that people ask today. They're like, I don't even have any direction in life. I don't know what to do next. Many people just wake up every day with no direction, no purpose. And Jesus declares, he says, I am the light of the world. So when we have a relationship with God, we have a relationship, an encounter with him. He says, I am the light of the world. So then we have the light actually in us because it's God in us, the hope of glory. And he shines a light and he shows us the path to take. The problem is sometimes we want to have we want to have all the answers ahead of time. And God's like, no, just trust me that I am the light. And when you have an encounter with me, when you have a relationship with me, I will guide you. And I will not only will you experience the God who says I am the light, but then you will be a light as well because God is in us. So we will be shining the light. So all I can hear right now is the words, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Mm -hmm. God said, let there be light, and the light separated from the darkness, and the light he called good. And now Jesus says, he is the light of the world. We know mm -hmm. that the light has overcome the darkness, the darkness cannot overcome the light. And that through this one who says, I am the light of the world, means that all the darkness in the world cannot extinguish even the light of one candle. Right. A picture of the eyes being able to perceive light. This is the overcoming of the blindness that we as non-believers walk in. We now find our way. We were lost, and we always know that the way out of the darkness is to what? To follow the light. Right. You then ask us, do you know what you're looking for? What a great question. Do you know what your purpose is? Do you know what... what you, you're on a search. You're on a quest. Right. But do you even know what you're looking for? Yeah. And people, again... They they feel lost, but they also don't even know what they're looking for. They're, they're looking for answers, and they don't even know which direction to look. They don't know, is it, can I find it in a relationship? Can I find it in success? Can I find it in fame? Where, I don't even know what I'm looking for. And that's where Jesus declares, I am the door. And, of course, the, the idea there that Jesus is sharing is that it's like a shepherd standing at the door, protecting and guiding his sheep. And he says, I, I am the door. I, I'm the one who will show you uh, where to go. I'm the one who will guide you. I'm the one who will protect you. Of course, the next statement is, as I am the good shepherd, which kind of goes hand in hand. But if you don't know what you're looking for, if you look to the great I am, he will show you that he is what you're looking for. And he will provide everything that you need. You know, as we look at this uh, I am in the book you've written, and we look at the 23rd Psalm, yep. we, we find that each one of these parallels is drawn, yep. and these statements are reinforced, so we would have a foundational understanding that God has already established who it was that was to come. And here are some of his attributes. The Lord is my shepherd. Mm-hmm. I shall not want. And as we go through that, we see that. Yeah. So then he says, "If now that I'm telling you that I'm the door, I want you to go through this door, but you're going to have to do it because you don't know what's on the other side. Right. I know what's on the other side. So you first of all, you're going to have to have faith in me to believe that if you open this door and go through it, there's something for you on the other side waiting for you. Right. You won't know what it is unless you what? You trust me. Yeah. And so that's when he declares, I am the good shepherd. And this perhaps could be one of the most powerful, at least for me personally, let me just speak personally. When I discovered the reality of that 
he is my good shepherd. And as you reference Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. He's my personal shepherd. He's the one who will guide me. And in this world, the question that many people are asking is, who can I trust? And people are trying to put their trust in all different types of things. They put their trust in money. They put their trust in their career. They put their trust in the government. They put their trust in all different types of things. And there's nothing wrong with necessarily any of those. But the problem is, all of us have been hurt, and all of us understand that we put our trust in someone, and they hurt us. Uh, we, we, we trusted someone, and they stabbed us in the back. They betrayed us. And I've had that, and of course I share that in the book. I share uh, some challenges that I walked through, even as a pastor, uh, kind of getting blindsided, didn't realize you know, people that I trusted uh, it hurt me. But then I realized the Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So I've hurt people, maybe not intentionally, but I've hurt people. They have hurt me because hurting people hurt people. But when I understand that he is the good shepherd, mm -hmm. then even when people hurt me, even when I trust people and they let me down, I'm okay. I mean, I might have to go through some time of healing, but I know for have confidence that I have the good shepherd. And he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And so I, out of that confidence, out of that security, that I have a relationship with the good shepherd, I can still trust people, knowing that it's possible I might get hurt again. But here's what I've done. I, th I think many people do this. When you've been hurt, when you've been wounded, you put up a wall. We all tend to do that because... You don't want to get hurt again. right? So you don't want to trust somebody because you're afraid that they're going to hurt you again. But what I discovered is when I isolate myself, and I think, guys, we tend to do this when we've been hurt, is you put up this wall, but you not only keep out, out who you think are the bad people, but you also keep out the good people, the people who can help you flourish, the people who can, who can pray for you, the people who can come alongside and encourage you when you're discouraged. And so... Uh, Therefore, we can take the risk and trust other people, knowing that, we worst case scenario, I have the Good Shepherd. And he says, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. And out of that, I realized that, uh, you know, um, it's worth taking the risk. We need each other, and uh, we can put our trust in God. Therefore, we don't have to look to all these other things to find uh, hope and, 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 and put our trust in. But when we put our trust in the Good Shepherd then we can, we can live the life that God has for us. You know, Matt, it's not often that I have the opportunity to um, frame a statement like this in this context, but you happen to be a part of ARC, uh, and what ARC does that no other church planting, church-related group does is they take their wounded and they bring them in and heal them. Hmm. They bring them in for the purpose of correction, restoration, fellowship. Mm -hmm. In all the years that I've known the ARC leaders, I've known them to be ones not perfect, right? not without sin, but when one of their brothers falls, they're there to catch them, mm -hmm. to guide them, to lead them, to help them, not to do what many do, which is to turn on them, to shun them, to put them out. And yeah. that is uh, a part of that calling to restore, that if you are going to be the hands and feet mm -hmm. of the Messiah, you can't be the hands and feet of Messiah out of the pick and choose translation of the Bible. Right. You have to be the hands and feet of Messiah even when your best friend falls. Right. You've got to be there to grab a hold of him even by a fingernail to pull him back off that cliff and yeah. get him back on the other side of it. Uh, it may not be full restoration, but it's going mm -hmm. to do everything that is humanly and biblically possible 
to yeah. help. And uh, I've seen it, as you have within ARC, as their response to that, uh, yeah. which means that there is shepherding, even mm -hmm. for the shepherds. Yep, that's a great point. I mean, we need each other. And, you know, uh, I, I, did, I shared in the book a story about when I wanted to quit. I wanted to give up. I wanted to throw in the towel. And it was in this chapter four where I talk about trust, which is probably why that chapter and that, and that principle for me is so personal. Because I came to the point, even as a successful pastor, what some people might call successful, we built our first building, we bought property, we're three and a half years old, the church was growing, but some people had left and some of them had talked negative about me. And it kind of blindsided me because I thought we'd all be one big happy family forever. I thought we, no one would ever leave. Right. And when they, that did happen, it devastated me and blindsided me because I just wasn't expecting it. Now, the church was doing fine, but I wasn't doing fine. Right. So I went and spent some time. Uh, the leadership team said, why don't you take a few days and, and, uh, and, and, and get away? So I spent some time with Pastor Greg Surratt at Seacoast Church in Charleston, South Carolina, who's the founder of the Ark. And at that time, I didn't knew nothing about the ark. The ark didn't—I think the ark didn't even exist then. And uh, he's—I spent some time with him, and he gave me some encouragement. He said, "Hey, Matt, people come and people go. It's part of a growing church." I spent a couple of days with him, and uh, he gave me the encouragement and the faith that I needed. I came back and re-engaged, and out of that relationship, having no idea, but because I was a very lonely pastor, I had in many ways isolated myself. It was kind of my fault. But I just didn't have any friends. I didn't have any pastor friends. But out of that relationship with Pastor Greg Surratt, then I met other pastors and then got involved in the ARC. And then not much longer after that, they asked me to serve on the leadership team. And these guys are now my best friends. And, and my kids, they're, they're, some of their best friends are other ARC pastors' kids. Right. And now we're part of this big family, and it's like this there brings this uh the safety and encouragement knowing that if any of us are going through a hard time that no one's going to look down on them they're not going to condemn them they're going to come alongside and say how can i help you how can i how can i keep you in the game and how can i encourage you <clears throat> well i i uh it, it's it's incredibly important uh and and i've been there myself so i've i i feel your pain i know what you've been through mm -hmm. uh and then you ask the question, do you need power? Yeah. And many people are looking for power. You know, they want, especially guys, we want power. So we think, hey, if I get a title, I get a degree, I get more money. And we might get some sense of earthly power. Like, I feel like I've got power over other people or I can control them. But Jesus declares the answer to this question, if you need power. He says, I am the resurrection, and the life. So he, he not only rose from the grave, he not only was resurrected, but he stands and says, I am the resurrection and the life. The same power that was displayed when I rose from the grave is available to you right now. And that word power in the Greek is dunamis, the same word we get dynamite from. Right. And so there is dynamite power that we have available to us when we understand that the great I am, that Jesus declares, I am the resurrection and the life. If you have something in your life that needs to be resurrected, he says, I am the resurrection and mm -hmm. I am the life. And then, of course, that question that if you answer no to this next question, then I would question you on every level, and that is, do you need more of God? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Many people are asking. They they want. They don't even know where to look for hope. And they when they even when they find God, they think, man, there must be something. I must be missing something. And I, I I need more of God. And Jesus declares, and this is probably the most powerful, as you mentioned. He says, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father." except through me and that he is not just it's not pick any god and you'll get to heaven you know it's not you play any meeny miny mo <laughs> it's he says i am the way I, i'm the only way i'm the only truth 
and I'm the only life. And when we find Jesus, we find the way, the truth, and the life. And we get all of God that we need. And really, here's the, here's the reality of it is, it's like, if I want more of God, then I must give him more of me and fully surrender my life to him. When Jesus makes this statement, he's making it to an audience that hears these words from Deuteronomy 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Mm -hmm. And these words today that I give you today are to be on your heart. And you shall talk about them when you walk where? Along the way. Mm. In Hebrew it's called Haderic. Jesus declares, I am the way. He's actually saying, I am that way. Yeah. And I am that truth. Mm. I am it. And he says, I am that life. Lachayim. The way that God's already instructed you that you're to walk mm. along this way. Jeremiah says, when you come to the crossroads, Choose the ancient path. That is the way to your peace. Mm -hmm. All of this connected to this statement of I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then the last question. <clears throat> or in chapter 7, are you connected? Right. <clears throat> are you a part of the vine? And then you leave the reader do you know who you are? Yeah. And now you get to declare as Jesus himself and God himself declares and the final words are I am who God says I am. Yep. Absolutely. In fact, we see the whole book kind of builds towards the end of the book in chapter 8 where it's those two aspects, I believe, of living the purpose and peace that God has for you in a crazy world, is, first of all, is discover who we are in Christ. And most of the book is about how to really discover who we are. But that's the first step. The second step is declaring who we are in Christ. Because we've all had words spoken over us, and sometimes those negative words can become labels that we live throughout life, and we think, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart, you know, I'm ugly, or maybe you've been abused or neglected, and you wear these labels. But rather than uh, declaring those labels, we can take those labels off, and then we can declare who God says that we are. And so the Bible, of course, is filled with some amazing uh, I am declarations of who we are. But we kind of narrowed it down to 31, one for every day of the month. And there's scripture uh, for each of the declarations. Of course, the I am participant guide goes into a lot more detail. Yes. And uh, there's a journal that goes with it. But we began to declare, in fact, I did this way before the, there was an idea of a book. <laughs> I didn't know I was, at that point I was going to write a book. But Martha and I were going through a, a challenging time and, and facing some unexpected challenges. And some of it was financial. And we weren't sure. It looked like there was no hope. It looks like we were up against a brick wall. We began to declare the promises of God every day. And it wasn't overnight, but we began to see some things happen that the only way to explain it is that God did it. He did a series of little miracles and a couple of big miracles. And it was like God gave us the faith and the courage to keep declaring. And then we saw miracle after miracle. And so some of these declarations are, for example, I am fearfully and wonderfully made by a holy God. I am God's masterpiece. I am made in the image of God. I am forgiven. I am redeemed. I am free. I am whole. And you declare these over these. I am more than a conqueror. Uh, I, am, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And we declare these over our life every day. And then that's where you see that God gives you the power. The, word, the Bible says that out of our mouth, uh, our words have the power of life or death. Or, or death. And so... Uh, I just sometimes I just I just say these out loud, and Martha and I will just say them out loud together. Let's just declare who we are. I am more than a conqueror Matt through Christ. <clears throat> Matt Fry, it has been a joy and honor to be with you, and I encourage our audience to get the book "I Am" and count of the one who gives you purpose and peace in a crazy world. 
Understand that your past does not define who you are, that your fears and insecurities can be replaced with the truth of God's Word, and that when you truly encounter God, you'll discover who you are, that you will become you are or I am who God says I am. Matt Fry, thank you so much for being with us here on Revealing the Truth. We wish you great success both with the congregation and with the book, and we hope to see you right back here on Revealing the Truth when you bring out that next book that I know you've got in the back of your mind. Can I add one more thing? One more thing, because we're about to go off the air. If you go to EncounterTheGreatIM.com, you can download the five videos that go along with the book and the guide. All right, we'll make sure to put that link. Encounter, give me that the one more time. Com. Encounter the great I am dot com. Thank right. you. All right, we'll post that to Facebook, Twitter. Don't forget, follow Igniting a Nation at ignitinganation.com or on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or wherever you can find social media. You'll find us, the home of Revealing the Truth, as well as the four speaking engagements I do each and every week, bringing you the inside view of prophecy as it unfolds in front of our very eyes. Until we see you back here tomorrow at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time, right here on the Igniting Nation Broadcast Network, we tell you and wish you shalom.